soul he doth restore again and me to all doth make within the paths of righteousness within the paths of righteousness in for his own name's sake yea though I walk in death's dark veil yet will Good morning. I have the pleasure of getting to introduce Rachel today. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about Rachel. Rachel Gray Nix was born in Searcy while her father was a student at Harding University. She grew up the oldest of three children and lived as a preacher's daughter in Tennessee, Italy, New Hampshire, and Indiana. Rachel met Tommy Nix while they were both on spring break during a Harding campaign in the Boston area during their freshman year of college. They married in July of 2003, recently celebrated their 15th wedding anniversary. Rachel went on to complete her Bachelor of Arts in English and graduated from Harding University in 2005. Rachel and Tommy have three children, Lila, who is 10, Rosalyn, who is 8, and Cyrus, who is 3. Rachel and Tommy lived in Little Rock, Oklahoma City, and Memphis while he was completing his medical degree, and they've been members at Valley View for seven years. Rachel is a physician's wife, a homeschooling mom, a wonderful daughter, sister, and as I've recently found, a wonderful friend. She loves to travel, good literature, her family, and more than anything else, as we all know, that had come to know Rachel, is her love for God and His Word. She loves that with all her heart. Rachel is going, to speaking, is going to be speaking to us today about Psalms 23, and it's a different take. It's from a book that Philip Keller wrote, and it's a shepherd's look at Psalm 23. We will all be so blessed by her message today.
Ah, all right. Well, I think it's important to say, first of all, that my mother wrote that introduction. I did not write it, so <laughs> just, uh, just to be clear. Um, let's address the elephant in the room first and foremost. This week has not at all gone as I anticipated. Um, one of these days I'm going to learn that they rarely go as I anticipate. Um, it was every bit my intention to stand in front of you this morning with my husband in Haiti not knowing when he was going to get out of Haiti and I was going to stand here and I was going to present um, what I have prepared because I absolutely refuse that the devil should be victorious in anything that he attempt or try. Um, my conviction is that it must be very important for me to stand up here this morning because he sure went all out to try and keep me from doing so. So we are um, going to proceed. I want to thank so many of you who have lifted us up and held us up in prayer through this week. I know that that is the reason that they are as we speak at the airport waiting on a flight later this afternoon and I praise God for that so um, if you would just give me just a moment of silence um, just to collect myself and then I'm going to lead us in prayer and we'll get started Father God, I praise you as the only God who is worthy of honor and praise. I praise you as our creator, our redeemer, our defender, and the one who saves us. I praise you as the one who is able to make a way out for us when we don't see a way out. And Father, I hope that I would have stood before you this morning and said all of those things regardless of the outcome of the night, regardless of where we found ourselves this morning. But I want to especially thank you this morning for hearing our prayers, for hearing our pleading, and for making a way out for those that we love. I pray that you would continue to lead them safely home, Father, as I know that you have promised to do for each one of us, that you hold us by the hand and you lead us where you would have us to go. Help us to have confidence in you, Lord. Help us to love you, help us to trust you, and help us to remember that in all things you are our good shepherd. Father, I pray this morning that you would guide my thoughts, that you would guard my mouth. Where I have prepared to say things, Lord, that you would not have me to say, I pray that you would prevent me from saying them. And if there are things that I have forgotten, Spirit, I pray that you would bring them to my mind and help me to convey the message, message that you would have spoken this morning. We thank you for the blood of your Son that binds us together. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, I was going to bring my timer up here, but it brings it makes me nervous. So um, you can either just sit here and listen till I'm done, or if I exceed time, somebody can you know like tap or something. I don't know, but. Um, I remember very clearly a beautiful September day, uh, the September that I was 17 years old. I had just moved away from home in Indiana, about 500 miles away, to attend school at Harding University. And I'm not going to lie, I was completely miserable. It was, in my mind, the worst mistake I had ever made. Um, but nonetheless, that morning was glorious enough that it shone through the gloom, and I noticed that the sky was clear the sun was shining the air was crisp you know it was that one fall day that we get in Arkansas and it was beautiful um, I was wrapped up in my own thoughts but what the DJ was saying on the radio broke through I heard some comment about a plane crashing into a building and I don't know why I concluded that he was joking but I do remember thinking that's not funny and I turned the radio off Went on to school, and as we got into chapel, the university president got up and addressed us to say that a second plane had crashed into a second sky, skyscraper in New York, and we now understood that this was not a mistake. Um, you all know where I'm going. Every one of you, with the exception of maybe my two little girls right there, remembers what that day was. You remember where you were, you remember what you heard, and you remember how you felt when you heard that um, the second airliner had flown into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. As chapel ended, we all headed to the nearest television, and that's where we stayed for the rest of that day. 
why do you think we did that? Well, I think horror, shock, certainly, solidarity, and hope initially. We really hoped that things weren't going to turn out the way it looked like they were going to turn out. And then as the day wore on and as things became more bleak, I think all we really wanted was comfort. We wanted someone to say something that would indicate that this wasn't as bad as it seemed, that it was all going to be okay, that it was all going to work out in the end. At 8.30 Eastern Time, President George W. Bush addressed the nation. He confirmed the rumors, he addressed the horrors that we had seen, and he outlined an intent going forward, and then he closed by saying this. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all those whose sense of safety and security has been threatened, and I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Those old, known, comforting words from David's 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23 is a cultural touchstone. Um, we hear it brought up at celebrity funerals. It's invoked in political speeches. You will even hear it in the occasional hip-hop lyric and um, action movie, which is weird. Um, do you even remember where you were the first time you heard it quoted or referenced? Maybe you learned to recite it as a small child. So right here at the top, aside from the fact that my mouth is really dry, so excuse me, um, I'm going to get myself in trouble because the first time I taught this, I got up in front of the ladies' class here at Valley View, and I said, will you please recite with me the Lord's 23rd Psalm? And then I went home at the end of the day, and it was all fine, and I got to thinking about it. I could not recite. And I texted my friend Kristen and she said, that's because you didn't say a word of the 23rd Psalm. You recited the Lord's Prayer, not the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> so, if I do that, will someone please wave or something instead of just letting me carry through the whole thing? I want you, if you will, to recite with me the 23rd Psalm as we begin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, so we all know it, but do we know it? Do we understand the implications of what David is saying in these much-loved words? So right at the top, I want to just address Aristotle's elements of circumstance, and you're thinking, what is that? Well, it's who, what, when, where, why of Psalm 23. Um, who wrote it? David. We know that. David was a shepherd. He was also known as the shepherd king. One, because of his previous career. Two, because he tended and led his people with such care. David was a shepherd, he was a king, but he was also a poet. And it's really important as we go forward that you remember that. What? A psalm comes from the Greek psalmos or psalaean, which means to pluck or play a stringed instrument. A psalm is written as a sacred poem or song, and in this case, it is a song of praise, and you need to remember that. We tend to come at Psalm 23 from the perspective of what it says about me, but David was talking about God. It's what it says about God and about David only in relation to God. When was it written? Well, the most authoritative answer I could find is inserted toward the end of David's life. I don't know what that means, but whether it was penned when David was a shepherd or in his later years as king, the where is the same, because he takes his inspiration from the days of quiet solitude, of sitting, tending his father's sheep. Just as we go forward, I want you to consider how would your relationship with the Lord, how would my relationship with the Lord look different if all you had to do was sit and talk to Him? We are so distracted by all the noise. Why? 
Well, in this psalm, David relates to God on his own terms. Have you noticed how often we do that? I, myself, might relate best to God as a parent. My husband might relate best to God as a physician. There are those who relate best to God as an advocate, a teacher, an artist, a builder, a preacher, or even a child. He is over all and in all and through all, Ephesians 4, 6. And he has made us, whoever we are, in his image and in his likeness. But then he took it a step further because he didn't just make himself relatable to us. He made us relatable to himself by being made in human likeness. He took on our weaknesses and our struggles and even our temptations. So, David having been a shepherd here in Psalm 23 paints for us a picture of God as a shepherd. Now, Israel was a pastoral people. So I want you to imagine that you're trying to explain to someone who's never used the internet what a browser is, or what a web address is, or what social media is, and that's basically what we're talking about. David uses language that is um, received and understood by his people. They're very, um, he's very specific in his use of language. They have a history and a heritage that's built on shepherds and shepherding. So they understand what he's talking about in a way that you and I don't off the top necessarily. But it's really important that we get it because Jesus himself would call himself the good shepherd. And in doing that, he is overtly linking himself to those words of David centuries before. Now, I don't know about you, but my experience with sheep is basically limited to the petting zoo. So I'm going to need some help. And for that, I'm going to turn to Philip Keller. Philip Keller was born in Kenya in 1920 to missionary parents and was himself a shepherd. In 1970, he would publish A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, which is now considered a devotional classic. Will you please raise your hand if you have read it? Okay. If you haven't, it is well worth your time. Um, he has changed my understanding and influenced my insight into Psalm 23. And I'm going to be referencing him throughout these sessions. So if you have your Bible with you, and if you haven't already, will you turn to Psalm 23? If you don't, I think we have it up on the screen. The King James Version says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You're also going to see on the screen um, the NIV version and the New Living translation. For myself, I find that I'm much more able to understand what the author is saying if I look across translations. It gives me a fuller context. Um, let's see. The Lord is my shepherd. This stands across any translation that I looked at. The Lord is the subject of the sentence. Shepherd is known as the direct object, which, um, in other words, shepherd restates Lord. It's drawing back to the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. This is how I hear it in my head. The Lord is my shepherd. Have you ever heard a small child bragging about his father? His voice glows when he says, that's my dad. And I think that's what David is saying here. So when David states the Lord is his shepherd, there's an expectation that the name the Lord is imbued with certain qualities. So what are they? What does David know about the Lord? What does he expect that his audience knows? Turn to Exodus chapter 3 verse 13, please. The Lord. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people, Yahweh, the God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Who are you? If I were to ask you that question, what would you say? 
most likely you would automatically link your answer to your husband, your parents, your home, your child, your career choice. But God, even down to his very name, is self-existent. He just is. The only being in the universe who is not dependent on anything or anyone, not even for his existence. Try and imagine what it must have been like to be Moses. To hear God say his own name in his own voice. The Israelites so revered this name that they would not even write it, much less say it. And as a result, the pronunciation was lost. Instead, they used the name Adonai, which means Lord or Master. But they knew who he was. Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, Adonai, the Lord Jehovah, God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, who smote the Egyptians and parted the Red Sea, the God of Joshua, who leveled great cities and caused the sun to stand still, the God of David, who conquered giants. What about us? Well, we don't know how to say his name, but we know who he is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what it was that Jesus said that incited the plot to kill him? He said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. God the author, God the artist, God the agent. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, God the author, God the, God the artist, God the agent, the creator. Turn to Job 38. I'm not going to read this whole chapter, although I really wanted to. If you haven't read the entirety of Job 38, I encourage you to do so. But it says, The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy? Who kept the sea inside the boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth and bring an end to the night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed between, beneath a seal. It is robed in brilliant colors. The light disturbs the wicked and stops the arm that is raised in violence. What humbles you? When do you find yourself pondering your own insignificance? As I mentioned, I'm from southern Indiana, which I'm somewhat biased in saying, I guess, is one of God's beautiful places. My parents live out in the country, so it's dark at night, which means the stars are bright. Every time I go out at night and I look up, I think of God telling Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. There are too many to count, and it's awe-inspiring to me. I'm reminded that I'm nothing. But do you know what gets me even more than that? Is when it snows and I go out and stand under the same stars and it's as though the entire world has stopped and is standing still. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. I crave silence, it's just the way God made me. So that peace, that stillness, that silence feels like God's miracle for me. At the same moment that I'm remembering I'm nothing, he's reminding me that he sees me, and he knows me, and he loves me. So I'll ask again, what humbles you? When do you find yourself pondering your own insignificance? 
And yet, he chose you in me. He chooses you and me. See, what David knew is that if the Lord is your shepherd, you're placing yourself in the hands of the one that made you. The one who can uniquely claim ownership over you because he is all things into being and maintains them in ordered unity. So I belong to him just because he made me. But there was a problem. People rebuffed his claim on them simply by virtue of authorship, and we turned our backs on him. So he took the first step again. He bought us back and demonstrated his rightful claim on us a second time. His third claim, his delight in caring for us. And this is really the theme of David's 23rd Psalm. It's the very reason that David selects the imagery of God as a shepherd. Philip Keller states that more than any other class of livestock, sheep require endless attention and meticulous care. What about our shepherd? John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my father knows me, and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. That's Jesus in his own words. If he is the shepherd, then we can't be anything but the sheep. Keller describes sheep as being fearful and timid, stupid and stubborn, and prone to perverse habits and a mob mentality. I don't know about you, but I don't think the parallels are too hard to draw. It's no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep, and we're going to examine that as we go along. So he, the Lord, Jehovah, the Creator, the Christ, is our shepherd. I shall not want. I lack nothing. There's a man named Victor who lives in a place called Apopa, El Salvador. He's my brother's age. He's 27 years old. When Victor decided to follow Jesus, his family disowned him. So he picked up and went off to school to learn how to effectively preach and teach God's word. While he was gone, the woman that he had loved for five years became pregnant by another man. Today, Victor lives with his disabled grandmother and an aunt in a neighborhood that is embroiled in constant gang wars. One side of the street is controlled by the 18th Street Gang, and the other side of the street is controlled by MS-13. And if you watch the news, you have heard of MS-13. Any job Victor applies for or holds must first be approved by the gang. Moving to a new neighborhood also requires gang approval. He currently works for two different churches, preaching and teaching essentially for free. His combined monthly income for his household is $300. And that's an improvement over last year. His doctors have said, I'm sorry, his grandmother is suffering from a slew of health problems, including renal failure, and the doctors have said there's nothing else they can do. So his aunt has quit her job, and they take turns sitting up with her at night. He's often awakened by her screams of pain. There is no peace to be found. And I think I have problems. And yet, my brother says that Victor has more passion and fire for the Lord than anyone else, what anyone else he has ever met. His story is one you will find the world over, time and time again. So we're left to ask the question, when David says, I have all that I need, what is he talking about? He's not talking about physical needs, clearly. There was a man named Paul, a man of power, position, education, and privilege. In one day, with one encounter, all of that was gone. He was imprisoned, whipped, beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked. He spent one night adrift at sea. He was hungry, helpless, thirsty, sleepless, and cold. And yet, he would say, for me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. 
There are those who would have you believe that if you're doing it right, not only will you never suffer, you'll have the best of everything. Life will be lived in abundance. You'll have the best car, the best house, the best clothes, the most influential friends. Jesus, I believe, would say that if you're doing it right, often the very opposite will be true. John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. He didn't say maybe. He said you would. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and cold and blind and naked. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus himself didn't even have a place to lay his head. So what is David saying? I think he's talking about peace. The peace of knowing whose you are. If the Lord is your shepherd, you can rest knowing that he sees your needs and he cares about them. This may not always look like what you hoped for, asked for, or expected. But Jesus said that the good shepherd knows his sheep. Unless and until we, like David, acknowledge the Lord's great love for us, made evident by his creation of us, his buying back of us, and his delight in caring for us, we will refuse to submit to his authority over us. This is what the world has done, and we don't have any problem recognizing their rebellion. It's pretty evident. But in fact, there are many of us who claim Jesus as Lord who are living the same way. Is that true of you? Because too often it's true of me. A shepherd once loved a sheep. She was the most beautiful sheep in his flock. Healthy, strong, and alert with an excellent coat of wool. She bore perfect lambs. She was a shepherd's pride and joy. But she had a problem. She always wanted to be somewhere else. Daily, she crawled the fence, looking for a place and a way to escape the shepherd's pastures. The irony was, she was escaping what was lush and green to get to the other side, which was brown and bare. Worse, she taught her lambs to do the same. Time and time again, the shepherd would find her and bring her back until one day, to save the rest of his flock from following her destructive behavior, the shepherd took his knife and killed her. Oof. How often am I guilty of restless discontentment? And remember what was worse, that fence-crawling sheep led others, her lambs, to follow her example. As a mother, I hear that. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ, who gives me strength. Okay, so. Sorry. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need in him. Now that we've established that, he makes me lie down in green pastures, or as the New Living Translation says, he lets me rest in green meadows. I find this fascinating. It's almost impossible to get a sheep to lie down unless four criteria are met. One, they have to be completely free from fear. Two, they have to be free from friction within the flock. Say that three times fast. Was that two? Did I say three? We're on three now. They have to be free from pests and parasites. Four, they have to be free of hunger and fully satisfied. Free from friction, fear, pests, and hunger. 
Now, if time were limitless, we would go into all the particulars of flock hierarchy, which is apparently a thing, and the constant bullying and vying that, uh, for position that goes on outside of the shepherd's gaze. Isn't that interesting, that it requires an awareness within the flock of the shepherd's presence for them to behave? Have you seen this at your house, like the minute you leave the room kind of thing? We'll look further at the effects of pests and parasites on a flock, but we're going to focus on um, the Good Shepherd and the full satisfaction that we can find only in Him. And in doing that, I want to park for a minute on the first requirement for a sheep to rest in quiet contentment, and because this one is really personal to me. Fear. All of my life I have struggled against fear and anxiety. There are times that it's almost debilitating. I mean, literally, like sitting in your house with the shades closed kind of thing. Often, it causes me to choose to miss out on new experiences and opportunities for growth. Sheep, too, are skittish and easily spooked. Something as unthreatening as a jackrabbit can cause an entire flock to bolt in blind fear. Do you know what I've noticed in my own life? It isn't true peril, but rather the unknown or the unexpected that has produced the greatest panic in my life. I used to joke that the key to making sure any particular trouble didn't happen to me was to worry about it. After all, it's not the crisis you expect that, blind, that flattens you, it is the crisis that blindsides you. We've learned a lesson in that this week. But the result of that mindset is that I've spent untold hours and sleepless nights dying a thousand deaths that will probably never happen to me. And in doing that, I've lost the joy and the peace that the shepherd affords. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Peace. The answer to fear is keeping my eye on the shepherd. In his 2017 book, Goliath Must Fall, Louis Giglio says, Why did David not feel terrorized by the giant? Because David constantly fixed his focus on someone bigger than Goliath. That's why David wasn't afraid of him. David set the Lord always before him. Because God was at David's right hand, David would not be shaken. Psalm chapter 16, verse 8. Philip Keller in the course of time, I came to realize that nothing so quieted and reassured the sheep as to see me in the field. The presence of their master and owner and protector put them at ease as nothing else could do, and this applied day and night. Peace. The complete assurance that my master, owner, and protector is present. Psalm 4, verse 8. In peace will I lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, will keep me safe. That's taped to my bathroom window. Bathroom window, bathroom mirror. Window would have been fine too, I guess. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So I'm going to ask, what is your blight, if you will? The thing that most often robs you of peace and makes it impossible for you to lie down in green pastures. Is it fear? The answer is keeping your eye on the shepherd. Is it jealousy, rivalry, strife between you and others in the flock? The answer is keeping your eye on the shepherd. Is it the distraction of constantly being bugged by the dilemmas, difficulties, and disagreements experienced that, and disagreeable experiences that pepper life, the drama? The answer is keeping your eye on the shepherd. Is it your tendency to feed on the barren ground of the world rather than the green pastures of the good shepherd, leaving you always restless and hungry? Guess what? The answer is keeping your eye on the shepherd. We have to honestly answer this question, each one of us. Wrestle with it, confess it, and allow him to transform us. Not, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And this same God who takes care of me 
will supply all your needs with his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Does this mean he's going to give you whatever you want? Or does it mean that he desires to become the answer to all that you want? All of your emptiness and brokenness. He leads me beside quiet waters. Or he leads me beside peaceful streams. One of the things I most love to reflect on as I consider the life and ministry of Jesus is the way he interacted with and cared for the marginalized. The poor, the displaced, sick, the shamed, children, and even women. That's an appropriate subject for us to reflect on today. His deep tenderness and compassion comes off the page. Nowhere is this more true than in John's account of Jesus meeting the woman at the well in John chapter 4. This chapter is one of my very favorites in the gospel accounts, and if you've talked to me very much and gotten me on this subject, you probably know why. Nevertheless, we're going to look at it as we think about the second verse of Psalm 23. What we see is um, Jesus journeying through Samaria with his disciples. It's midday, it's hot, and Jesus is tired, and he sits down by a well to rest while his disciples go and find food. Now, understand that a respectable Jew never would have been where Jesus was in the first place. A Jew would have gone around, out of the way, to avoid this because Jews hated Samaritans. Forget stopping there and sitting for a spell. It wasn't done. But this is where Jesus sits. <clears throat> and who should come along but a local woman out to fetch water? Don't miss this part because she's sneaking out. Nobody goes to fetch water during the hottest part of the day, but she does, and soon we understand why. See, this woman has a reputation. She's a woman of loose morals. She's always with a different man. She's had five husbands already, and the one she has now isn't actually her husband. Nobody who has any self-respect is going to be seen associating with her. The women of the village whisper about her and hurry inside when they see her coming. The men either leer at her or look away because they don't want anybody to misinterpret. So, it's just easier if she makes herself invisible. It's less painful that way. Yet out of nowhere, here's this man. A Jewish man, an intelligent man, a kind man. He looks right at her when he speaks to her. He doesn't flinch away like he's in danger of touching something dirty. Instead, he asks her for a drink. And then he says, if you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Here's what I want you to get. Jesus stopped there for this woman, this one woman, and she rewards him for his effort. Because while his own people, the priests, the religious leaders, even his family, are actively denying and rejecting and persecuting him, she takes what he offers and she embraces it wholeheartedly, desperately, like someone dying of thirst. But she doesn't just keep it to herself. This woman, who has worn her shame like a garment, allowing it to mark her as dirty and worthless and small, isn't hiding anymore. With one encounter, she's transformed, and what she has found is too good to be kept to herself. John tells us she left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? And you know what? People listened. They came streaming to see Jesus. Do you know why? Because that kind of transformation makes an impression. And in the end, we are all dying of thirst. Like most living things, the body of a sheep is made up primarily of water. Whenever fluid levels drop off, desiccation of tissue begins to set in. The first indication that this is happening is thirst. You may have heard that sheep aren't very smart, and here's the problem. 
Outside of the shepherd's provision, a sheep is almost always incapable of finding a pure, clean source of water. They will often end up drinking from polluted potholes, and the result is disease. Does that sound familiar? Can we draw any parallel? What David knew, what Jesus was teaching this woman, is that the soul of every man and woman thirsts after living water. All of human history is bound up in our insatiable thirst for God. What do I mean by that? So rarely have we recognized that he is what we thirst for, and thereby the only source of water that will satisfy. So we've tried to quench our thirst in the dirty puddle of idolatry, philosophy, sexual immorality, greed, war, and even religion. And those are just the big things, if you want to put it that way. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 says, For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Some of my earliest recollections are moving to Searcy with my parents. We were there for a time in 1987, and I remember a cappella performing on Harding's campus there. Um, this was during the time that Keith Lancaster was still part of the quartet, so of course we went. And we had a cassette tape from that performance that followed me through the entirety of my childhood. One of my favorite songs on that cassette tape was Better Than Life, and the first time I sat down to write this lesson, that song was playing on a loop in my head. As it turns out, the lyrics are taken directly from David's Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. <clears throat> now, strange as it may appear on the surface, the deep wells of God from which we may drink are not always necessarily the delightful experiences we may imagine them to be. I recall so clearly standing under the blazing equatorial sun of Africa and watching the native herds being led to their owner's water wells. Some of these were enormous hand-hewn caverns cut from the sandstone formation along the sandy rivers. They were like great rooms chiseled out of the rocks with ramps running down to the water trough at the bottom. The herds and flocks were led down into these deep cisterns where cool, clear, clean water awaited them. But down in the well, stripped naked, was the owner, bailing water to satisfy the flock. It was hard, heavy, hot work. Perspiration poured off the body of the baler, whose skin glistened under the strain and heat of his labor. As I stood there watching the animals quench their thirst at the still waters, I was again immensely impressed by the fact that everything hinged and depended upon the diligent owner, the shepherd. Only through his energy, his effort, his sweat, his strength could the sheep be satisfied. In the Christian life, exactly the same applies. Many of the places we may be led into will appear to us as dark, deep, dangerous, and somewhat disagreeable. But it simply must be remembered that he is there with us in it. He's very much at work in this situation. It is his energy, effort, and strength expended on my behalf that even in this dark, deep place is bound to produce a benefit for me. It is here that I will discover he only can really satisfy me. It is he who makes sense and purpose and meaning come out of situations that otherwise would be but a mockery to me. Suddenly, life starts to have significance. I discover I am the object of his special care and attention. 
dignity and direction come into the events of my life and I see them sorting themselves out into a definite pattern of usefulness. All of this is refreshing, stimulating, invigorating. My thirst for reality in life is assuaged and I discover that I have found that satisfaction is in my master. Now I lost my place. I hope you see and understand why David believes that we can trust ourselves to God's control. You can. And you can know that he will not hesitate to do the very best for you. After all, he didn't hesitate even to give his life for you. If the Lord is your shepherd, you have all that you need. Um, I have a poem entitled, How Did I Do Today, God? The day is done, night is here, and I sit in the quiet as my family sleeps near. My mind is frozen with writer's block, unsure of what God wants me to say. I could go in a zillion directions with thoughts of my own, but keep thinking of today and the question I saw posted in a grab-your-attention kind of way. People are watching you, and they want to know, how does faith make your life different? Does your life point to Him? Does your life show the way to the Father and to the freedom from sin? Does it point to the truth? Or is it just for show? Does your life truly point the way to go? As I ponder this question, I think of my day. Did I reach out to others? Did I offer a hug? Did I offer kind words and genuine love? Did I forgive and let go of their trespasses against me? Was I humble and gracious, or did I hold a grudge? and close the door on showing his amazing unconditional love? Did I argue with my neighbor when my button was pushed, or did I pray for patience and a gracious response? Did I unload all my burdens onto my spouse, or did I give them to the Lord and keep peace in my house? Did I model the fruits of the Spirit to my children, or did I falter and succumb to the pressures and fail them? Did I argue and push others by throwing Scripture in their face, or did I instead invite them in with love and offer a warm place? These are the questions I'm pondering tonight, stumped with what blog post should I write, and maybe this is God's way to check in and see and ensure I'm remembering him and not just me. Some of you guys may be like me and your coffee might be kind of going through if you want. But go ahead. We're going to take a little break to go to the restroom. If you want to drink a water, we've got water fountains out there too. Restrooms are uh, out the back and to the left. And then we also have one down in the hallway as well. 